Okay, folks, uh, what I'm going to do now is invite uh, Sergeant Joseph Haverty to come over here. How you doing, sir? Good, how are you? Good. Um, tell the American people a little bit about yourself, how long you served, and where you're from. All right, my name is uh, Sergeant Joseph Haverty. I've served for five years, two in the reserves, three on active duty. I'm from Goldsboro, North Carolina, and uh, I'm a 68 Whiskey combat medic. Okay, and... Um, you're going to, what, to take us around the aid station here? Yes, sir. I'm going to take you on a tour of uh, the Ramadi Level 2 aid station, show you some of the ins and the outs of the day-to-day -day operations, something that uh, a lot of people don't get to see unless they're here, and it's usually not very good for them. Right, exactly. So do you want to start here? Or do you have a particular place you want to start from? This is as good as any. Okay. Okay. Well, would you like me to carry the mic? Yeah, sure. All right. Carry the mic. All right, the room you're in right now is, uh, if you take a look around, see medical equipment on the walls and a couple stretchers. The door right behind the camera is actually a door to the operating room. And uh, this is the pre-op area where we stage patients after they've had the immediate life-saving care applied to them out in the trauma bay, which we'll get to later. Also, after they come out of the operation room, this is where they'll go to post-op immediately while they're waiting on evacuation to higher levels of care. We just want to make sure that uh, they don't expire under our care here. The idea is to make sure that when people come in alive, they leave alive. So. It uh, raises their chances every level they get to. Immediately to our right is our uh, company operations. They're kind of busy right now, so we're not going to take you in there. But um, to our left is the pharmacy where we hold all the medications that we use regularly. Uh, we have hundreds of medications in there, so we can treat basically anything. There's very little we can't treat here. Um, Okay, if you'll follow me, we'll uh, take you into the main part of the aid station, show you a little bit about what goes on at a deeper level. <clears throat> Immediately to the camera's right, my left, is our uh, office. It's where our medics chill out and wait for the uh, patients to come in so we can go ahead and screen them and treat them. Uh, we have our platoon sergeant who's not currently here. Her desk is in here. Uh, one of our lieutenant, our PL's offices is in here. He's got a couple different desks depending on what he's doing at any given time. And then we have the uh, 68 Golf, which is patient administration. They come in here and they sign the patients in so we know what category to file them under. You're actually backing up into the PL's office right now. That's where a lot of the moving and shaking gets done behind the scenes. You hardly ever know what happens in there until you get a directive to do later on, carry out some, uh, some missions, okay? Immediately in front of us is the opening to the trauma bay. It's a... Uh, not to be confused, it's not only trauma, it's basically the treatment bay would be more specific. We have four beds that can treat uh, pretty much any life-saving threat. To our left, we have one of our ancillary support services. That's the physical therapist, Captain Preezy's right there. Her tech is right behind you, that's uh, Sergeant Wolf. People have regular sports injuries or maybe they had a combat injury and they just need some rehabilitation. They go in there and she hooks them up get them squared away so they can get back to 100% mission effectiveness. <clears throat> Here we got some work going on, just uh, typical day-to-day -day sick call stuff. We've been lucky enough since we've been here for about six to eight weeks to not have anything too serious happen. Although we are prepared for that, it's pretty good that we don't actually see that very often. We did a, a couple weeks before we actually stepped in have a pretty serious incident con uh, concerning some Iraqi civilians. And uh, luckily, we haven't had anything since then. So, uh, that was my question. Do you treat Iraqis and they can come in here? Well, going with the handoff, if it's something that coalition forces cause, like if it's an injury that we directly cause, then we will take responsibility for those civilians and treat them. Or if it's easier to get to us than it is for them to get to their own Iraqi treatment facilities, we'll go ahead and treat them just to save their lives before we evac them out. The Red Crescent, who's our Iraqi counterpart, pretty much the equivalent of our Red Cross, they have the number one priority for Iraqi civilians. Uh, unless, like I said, it's coalition caused. So if at all possible, we try to get them to their own hospitals just because they're gonna end up evac there anyway. To our left right here is another one of our ancillary services, is uh, X-ray. And uh, with the, the physical therapy coupled with the X-ray, and our lab, which is up here on the left, that's what makes this facility a level two treatment facility. Level one treatment facilities all have a trauma bay, so they can treat immediate life-saving threats. But the thing that sets us above the rest is that we can do blood work, we can do x-rays, 
we can do physical therapy. Um, let me check real quick. Yep, Sergeant Valdez is just hanging out inside the office right now, filing some reports for some blood work he's done. There's a no end really to what kind of labs we can do here. It's basically equipment dependent and that's constantly rotating based on the orders. But uh, this is obviously, like I said, one of the situations, one of the things that sets us apart from a regular level one aid station. Around the back side of the building is, uh, we have a triage area where all the patients come in in case of a mass cow. And uh, if you want me to show you guys that, I'll be more than happy to. All right. That was back in the operations room, actually. Yes, sir. We actually got a lot because the post office didn't pick up any mail last week. So they had like 53 tri walls full of packages. It's taken a while to sort out exactly who gets what. All right, but as you see over here on the right and on the left, we have some supplies staged for uh, the, the event that we have a mass cow, which is a mass casualty situation, which basically by definition is having more casualties than we can handle immediately. So that's when you basically have to do triage. You decide which patients are the worst, which ones need your care right now. And that's how we decide based on uh, their injuries. And outside is where we actually do all the decision making. But we stage this stuff as soon as we get the call that there's incoming casualties just in case. So uh, we're ready to go and we don't waste precious time. This is our triage facility. If you want to call it a facility, it's also a makeshift storage area for stuff that we need and quick, fast, in a hurry. What you have above you is a, like a little attic space and those are litter stands so we can stage all the litters that you saw inside the doorway and you can set them up and you can actually start treating patients while you're out here and waiting for an open table inside. We have a ping pong table over there for whenever we get bored and it's not too hot. You know, waste a few minutes knocking a ball back and forth. You see a couple tri walls full of medical equipment that we might need to use out here. It's also full of excess that we can't readily stage inside. It's, it's kept as cool as we can keep it, but when it's 110 degrees outside, you can only make it so cool. So uh, that's usually how our medical supplies come in. We pick them up, get a forklift, drop them off, and then uh, we go through them and figure out what we need and put the rest somewhere else in our supply area. If you turn to the camera's right, you'll see that we have a walkway on the other side of these barriers. Well, it's a more driveway. This is where the field litter ambulances roll up when they're full of patients, and they roll up to right in front of this walkway right here. They're downloaded based on precedence and in their injuries, and they're brought under the shaded area. And then we choose who goes in first. We will eventually get to everybody. That is absolutely true. We just have to decide who goes first based on their injuries. On the other side of the T-walls over here, we have some of the soldiers' living quarters. And immediately on the other side is the dental office, which is another one of our ancillary support services that makes us a level two treatment facility. If you see down here, straight down there to that opening on the other side of those barriers, that's our helicopter landing zone for medevacs. That can be anything from you know, extremely serious trauma casualties to maybe somebody has some chest pain, but we don't have the proper machinery to truly diagnose what the issue is. They'll get evac just the same. Sometimes people, we had a patient with malaria actually, he had to get medically evac So we can do pretty much anything here. That's basically the gist of the aid station. You know, I gave you a rough overview, but day to day, there's a whole lot going on depending on how many patients decide they want to be sick that day. Yes, sir. Uh, you only have two in there right now, so it's, a, it's pretty light right now, right? Well, some days, I haven't quite figured out the rhyme or reason behind it, or are busier than others. But for the most part, we haven't had too much of anything other than the sniffles or people getting cuts while they're moving some equipment around, stuff like that. A couple sutures here and there. Somebody might get dehydrated, so we give them some intravenous fluid. You know, typical basic stuff. What about um, heat exhaustion or dehydration? Do you get much of that? or the, I had asked them, uh, some other medics earlier that. Well, mostly, as far as the heat goes, we know it's ridiculous hot out here. It's probably like 115 degrees right now. It's so hot that your sweat pretty much evaporates as soon as it comes out, and you don't start sweating until you go inside. But since it's so hot outside, we're, it's 
it's always on our mind to stay hydrated. So you'll go through two, three gallons of water in a day, no problem, you try to maintain that because it's actually against the rules to get dehydrated, go figure. But uh, as far as heat casualties go, it's nothing too serious beyond your basic cramps. And then you just get a liter or two of IV fluid and drink more water, you're good to go. Okay, well I appreciate you sharing all this with us. My pleasure, yeah. sir. Uh, why don't you look in the camera and give a shout out to some family and friends back home. Absolutely. Hey wife, it's me. <laughs> I know it's been a while since you've seen my face. But I miss you, and I love you, and I can't wait to come home. I tell Copenhagen and Hank and Merlin I said hi, too, and I can't wait to go play with them and go fishing and get muddy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service to our country. My pleasure. Thank you. Again, folks, you've heard it here on TalkingWithHeroes.com. Uh, we just completed a, a tour of the Ramadi Level 2 aid station here at Camp Ramadi. I want to thank Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for making this trip possible, embry-riddle.edu, and Mark Leiden with DoThisGetHired.com. Help us get the word out about these videos to as many people as you can. This is Bob Calvert, your host on TalkingWithHeroes.com, reporting from Iraq. We'll be back with more.